Familiar faces, I see some new faces. So uh, my name's John Heiss, I'm from the National Institutes of Health. I have a lot of slides, I'm not going to show you all of them. Maybe uh, we would just uh, discuss some of the, the first slides, that, that would be fine with me, or, or we could go through the whole presentation. I don't have any conflicts. Um, you know, the, the NIH, for people who don't know much about it, it's, uh, its main fo foci are science and training. And the, the science is uh, to uh, produce knowledge in the public interest. And we have to train the next generation of scientists, too. So grants from the NIH are generally for research or for training. Now, I searched this morning uh, for research studies on clinicaltrials.gov, and these are clinical studies where they're prospective and they're registered, and I found seven, and uh, there's only four that are active, and you'll, one of these is uh, from uh, uh, St. Louis, and uh, that's, you'll be hearing about that, the posterior fossa decompression with or without duroplasty for Chiari type one malformation. There's also one that was completed uh, for cell therapy and, and the rest of them have been from the NIH. Um, so here, just, I don't have a, maybe I do. Do I have a laser? Okay, good, good enough, well, I have my finger. Okay, so how do we produce physician scientists and, and people who will take the uh, field forward? Well, you have to start in medical school, and, uh, and you can have students who will take classes in the summer, and you can have other support for the medical students, and then they'll show some promise, and they might get a MD-PhD, like Dr. Luciano did, and you get these grants, uh, these are NIH grants for funding, and then, in general, the residents with a research, or the medical students with a research background, they go to a residency where there's funding for NIH research. And uh, the other residents, that doesn't mean that people in other programs won't end up doing research later. It's just they have to get residency training during their residencies. So if you look at this, uh, I made this graphic up, but it, with the help uh, from the NIH training page, say you decided you didn't think you were going, you were interested in research, but you know during your training, you might get funding, you might find that you have interest in research, and ASA and uh, CSF could give you a grant, or you could get a, a governmental grant. But generally speaking, you'd have to get some fee, uh, seed money. From a, chair, uh, from a charity uh, such as CSF, and then you would get uh, probably a non-NIDS funded grant, and then if uh, you're productive, then that might lead to an NIH R01, so you can still become a physician scientist. More likely, you would have promise, show promise in medical school, then you would go to a research institution where there are people who have NIDS or NIH funding they have, and then they will, you will emulate them and you will end up being a research scientist. And if you receive an R01 grant, that's the mark of a physician scientist. And what do you get from that? Well, you get time. And time is a very precious commodity because if you're doing one thing, it means you're not doing something else. And so if you're doing all neurosurgery, um, it, it leaves very little time for research. Now, for other specialties, uh, the NIH demands, say, 70 percent commitment to research. But for neurosurgery, uh, they've made a concession because a neurosurgeon has to practice. So it's 50 percent research, 50 percent clinical. And then the final goal is to get sustained NIH funding as a physician scientist, and then you have time on your hands. You can still do research without research grants, but you do really have indirect funding from your academic center because they're paying your salary and they expect you to do uh, research. So you can do research. You can be a contributor to the fund of knowledge uh, 
in private practice, and uh, I think Fraser Henderson, he has an academic uh, affiliation, but mo primarily in private practice, and he's, he produces research. You can be a non-NINDS funded uh, researcher, and, and uh, CSF provides grants for those people uh, as well. So there are lots, everyone is needed, it's a big community, but the funding allows a researcher to spend more of their time doing research, less of their time doing clinical care. All right. <clears throat> Are there any questions on that? Anybody want to discuss that concept? Everybody understands how, yeah, money's required for research. <laughs> it's, okay. It's training and, and for the research itself. So that's how the NIH funds things and that's how other charities uh, funds things too. So there are a lot of groups here. Syringomyelia, it's a condition, uh, uh, comes from the Greek uh, syrinx, which is Piper tube and Milo's, which is uh, marrow or spinal cord, and it occurs in about one out of 10,000 people. And the 20 to 50 year old group is where it presents uh, most often. Uh, you have a distension of the spinal cord. Some people call it hydrocephalus of the spinal cord. And uh, this swelling or this fluid collection uh, wipes out the nerves. Uh, for the, the muscles in the arms and the hands, and you also get loss of pain and temperature sensation, and uh, you lose sensation, but you get this condition called neuropathic pain. <clears throat> and uh, once the syrinx gets large enough, it ex extends and it uh, stretches these white matter fibers, and you get lower extremity clumsiness and impaired ambulation. Um, Syringomyelia always develops from an underlying condition. Uh, you either have a block in the spine or a block at the foramen magnum. Here, this is a Chiari 1 malformation. You can see the cerebellar tonsils are like a, a cork in a bottle here at the foramen magnum. You can also have uh, arachnoiditis, spinal deformity, and you can have uh, lesions of the spinal cord. So these were just uh, 28 patients. So we, we decided to look for these symptoms. Uh, you know, headache is very common in Chiari patients, headache with cough, dysesthetic pain, and it's, some people don't have it, but uh, in some it's just mild or moderate. But the, all these people had Chiari and syringomyelia, not just Chiari in and of itself. And uh, the signs are things that we could uh, find on neurologic exam, such as atrophy, ataxia, sensory loss. So we performed uh, a study at the NIH just to look at the physiology and uh, what you want to do is you, you want to make observations consistent with the theory and the, the theories at the time we started this study said that uh, the fluid from the fourth ventricle made it through a little canal and then would cause a, a syrinx but the problem with that theory is that there's really a, not a clear connection in adults uh, between the fourth ventricle and the syring. So really, we didn't see how that fluid could, could get between the fourth ventricle and the syrinx. Um, there was a lot of, uh, there was an observation that if you did a posterior fossa decompression, that about 80% of people would get better, and putting in a shunt actually led to people doing worse if you, if you added a shunt to a decompression. That's a decompression, just remove the bone, and um, then there's controversy what you do after that, we open the dura and then put a graft in. Other people go in further. Other people just leave it at the bone decompression. So our theory was a small posterior fossa would end up leaving the uh, brain uh, in a very uh, narrow, uh, tight uh, spot, which means that it would have reduced uh, compliance. And so every time the heart would beat, you would get more uh, pulsations out of the tonsils and that would compress the fluid in the spinal canal and that would drive fluid into the syrinx and after a syrinx formed, um, this pulsation would lead to fluid movement in the syrinx. So we studied uh, these groups and we just looked at all these things, uh, 
whether there was a partial obstruction at the frame and magnum, was there a block of CSF flow at the frame and magnum. There was tonsillar motion. And so we measured, and you can see there's a big difference between normal and Chiari as far as this black signal, which indicates cerebral spinal fluid. And we measure that and, and the spaces both ventrally and dorsally in front and behind the brainstem were small in this group. We also saw that even though you really didn't see flow at the frame and magnum, and despite that you could see flow of fluid in the syrinx. And the, the flow of the CSF at the frame and magnum was actually higher than uh, in normal patients, which was uh, contrary to previous expectations and reports, but after that everyone has agreed with our findings. Um, it was a Quackenstedt's test. We just measured uh, pressure transmission. Here's normal. And you could see that before surgery, pressure transmission was slow. After surgery, it became normal. And that's just that. And then we wanted to look at would the tonsils move uh, during the cardiac cycle. And you can see every time, every time the heart beats, that's, see the finger there? the tonsils move. And here's the syrinx. And if the fluid was coming from the inside, you would expect when the tonsil would go down that the syrinx would get bigger, but it actually got smaller, which implies that there's a pressure wave is hitting the spinal cord from outside. And we actually measured that because we had 30 frames uh, a second. We could we saw that when the pressure was highest, the syrinx was the smallest. So that confirmed that. And uh, I'm a little short on time, but suffice it to say, the tonsils do pulsate. We just opened the dura a little bit. and then So there's a lot of pulsation every time the heart beats. OK, we looked at the compliance, and the, that uh, showed that it actually was very a very tight situation uh, if you look at the normal compared to the Chiari patients. And that the, the pressure in both the cervical spine and the pulse pressure, the pulsation, was greater in Chiari compared to our normal subjects. And here you could see that despite this is a, a Cine MRI, it's a pretty old at this time, but there's really no flow at the frame and magnum, but, but despite that you have flow in the syrinx. And if you have a good decompression, then you'll uh, relieve the block, and relieving the block ends up relieving the syrinx. Here's the syrinx here, and the syrinx has resolved here. And, and what the block causes the syrinx, relieving the block makes the syrinx go away. And long-term outcome, in general, symptoms improve some, but not completely. That's why if you have syringomyelia, you should have it treated early if you're having symptoms, so because some of these deficits aren't reversible. Uh, with primary spinal syringomyelia, that's the type associated with arachnoiditis or uh, trauma. Oh, 1354, okay. Um, here's, a, here's a patient from New York. He had an unsuspected cyst. They wanted to put a shunt in his syrinx, but we found a, a cyst. And uh, if you can find the block, here, here, I, well, I'm running short on time. If you can find the block, you can see here the pulsation of the syrinx during the cardiac cycle. If you can find the block and you remove the, the cyst, the syrinx will go away. As shown here, here's the syrinx, and, and here it's gone away. So it's pretty simple. If you have a block, either at the frame and magnum or in the spinal canal, and you relieve that, the syrinx will go away, and the block is a cause for the syringomyelia. And if you relieve the block, the, 
the uh, syrinx will go away. Now, if you have a tumor, that's a different type of pathophysiology. You have to remove the tumor. If you have a glial ependymal cyst, that's another type of pathology. You have to drain that. But if you have a syrinx related to a block, if you relieve the block, the syrinx will go away. Okay.